Hey guys, Kevin here. I wanted to share with you a new development with the podcast. It is coming to you from a new podcast hosting service, Anchor.fm. So far, I'm really impressed. I really like it. Uh, Number one, it's free, which is always great. It's also integrated with Spotify and offers some great analytics on who's listening. Helps me gain some insight into what content would be good for the audience. And you can also record from your phone, which is a nice new feature that I'm using right now. So if you have a podcast or you're interested in starting one, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there. Welcome to Can't Make This Up. Uh, This is a podcast where uh, I get the privilege of talking with historians from around the world about their latest work. My name's Kevin. I'm going to be your host for today. So in today's episode, uh, we are going way far back. We spend a lot of time on this podcast looking at the 19th and 20th centuries. Today we're going back. We are going to talk about King Arthur. Um, My guest today is John Matthews. He is a lifelong uh, Arthurian scholar. Uh, He has written a book, uh, a collection of Arthurian tales. Some are retellings of the stories you may be familiar with, and some are completely new and haven't been translated into English before. Uh, But the book we're going to talk about today is The Great Book of King Arthur and His Knights of the Round Table. This was a lot of fun to talk about, definitely enjoyed it, and I hope you will too. As always, if you've listened to a few episodes and you like this podcast, uh, you know, please subscribe to it on whatever you listen to. Uh, if you watch it on YouTube, please subscribe to it there uh, and leave a review. I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, and that really helps get word out about the show. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can find me at, at CMTU History. Uh, and then as you listen to this episode uh, and this uh, King Arthur is something that you really enjoy, Uh, John was nice enough to stick around and talk about what it was like for him to be a film consultant uh, on the set of the 2005 King Arthur movie starring Clive Owen. Uh, And you can check out that bonus conversation uh, over on the show's Patreon page. All right, so without further ado, here is my conversation with John Matthews. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools And stories that are just too crazy to believe The stranger than fiction and super unique Hi, John. Welcome to Can't Make This Up. Hi there, Kevin. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> uh, really glad to have you on. Uh, normally, we bounce around between the 19th and 20th centuries, and we don't often get the opportunity to go back to the Middle Ages. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here and I'm um, looking forward to our chat. Um, so uh, my guest today is uh, John Matthews, and he is a uh, lifelong scholar of King Arthur. Um, so can you start out by telling us a little bit about, about you and uh, your long career studying King Arthur? Well, um, it began really uh, when I was about 15. Um, I read a, a book by T.H. White called The Once and Future King, She's quite well known, I think. Um, it became the musical Camelot and then the film of the musical. Um, and um, it has, it, it rang a huge bell for me. Um, I'd already decided with all the sort of confidence of youth that I wanted to be a writer and I was looking for a subject. And I thought about Vikings and I'd started doing a bit of research on Vikings. And then I read T.H. White's book and I knew I'd found my topic. And so I started studying from that point on. Um, This is now going back over 50 years. And the first thing I discovered was at that time I was living in London um, and I discovered that my local library had a very large section, in fact, a whole special collection on folklore and mythology. So I was in a very good place to, to find what I wanted. And I basically just went in there and took out four books, read those, took another four, read those and so on and just kept on looking until I felt that I'd found 
you know, the essence of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important parts of that, of course, was Thomas Mallory's great book, Le Morte d'Arthur. And my new book is really a kind of tribute to both Mallory himself and to that book. So, um, you know, you mentioned Sir Thomas Mallory and, and your book is, is actually dedicated to him. Um, could you tell us, uh, you know, who, who was this person and, and what was his role in, in preserving what we know of Arthurian legends? Well, Mallory is a bit of an enigma uh, for several reasons. First of all, there are three or four people who have that name, although it's spelled in different ways. Um, and there are several different arguments out there among the scholars as to which one is which. I happen to think that the one um, that best fits the picture <clears throat> is Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel in Warwickshire, who was himself a soldier, uh, a politician for a while, um, a bit of a wild man in his youth, always being arrested for everything from burglary to assault. Um, um, but he became a soldier and he was very much involved in the period of the Wars of the Roses, you know, the great sort of internal strife between the houses of York and Lancaster. And he fought on both sides. He changed sides a couple of times. And it just happened that at the end of the wars, he was on the losing side. And so he ended up as a political prisoner. And it was while he was in Newgate Jail in London that he wrote this book. He had access to a library, astonishingly, and was able to peruse a lot of books, mostly in French. And basically he wrote what was the first connected narrative about Arthur in English. Um, he, he basically wrote the first English novel, I think. Not everyone would agree with that, but I think that's, that's what he did because he, 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 he wrote a coherent story with extraordinary characters, um, dialogue, plenty of dialogue at a time when you've got very little of that in, in a medieval literature. So he was a very important figure. The book was eventually published by William Caxton, who's the famous printer, in 1485 actually some 15 years after Mallory had died. Um, and we're still not quite sure what happened to the manuscript in between, but Caxton edited it and he retitled it Le Morte de Arthur, in other words, The Death of Arthur, um, while Mallory himself probably wanted to call it by a very long and worthy title like The Great Book of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which is uh, where I got that idea of calling my book. And, and that was a very large, multi, multiple volume uh, work. Well, it was one volume, but it's over a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. um, I did an edition of it in, in the year 2000 as a kind of millennial thing. I, you know, reworked some of the, uh, the old English, which is not so easy for us to read today, gave it modern spellings and so on. Um, and uh, while I was doing that, I really started thinking He's put everything in here. He's got the whole story of Lancelot and Guinevere, the quest for the grail, uh, the love story of Tristan and Isolt, uh, lots about Arthur, Sword in the Stone, Morgan Le Fay, all these things that have since become quite familiar to us in terms of movies and TV series and many, many novels. But as I was thinking that, I also thought, but he didn't put in that story or that story. He didn't tell about a Venable who was a a girl who became a knight. He didn't tell uh, the story of um, Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, lots of things were left out. And I kept pondering on that. And um, eventually I thought, well, let me try and see if I can make a new Mort d'Arthur that will put in as many of the stories as possible that Mallory left out and put it into the language and context that makes it readable for us today. So that's really what I've done with this book. Um, there are 38 stories in it, and I have quite enough for at least two more volumes if my publisher will let me. So it's the beginning of something much bigger. Oh, wow. Um, I guess before we move on to what you've done with, with your collection, um, I guess for listeners who might only be somewhat vaguely familiar with the figure uh, and character of King Arthur, um, can you just kind of give us a, a, a bare bones explanation of who we're talking about when we're talking about King Arthur 
And are we talking about just a literary figure or are we talking about an actual historical person? Well, it's both. Um, and again, there are many theories and many arguments about this. Um, the book that I am currently copy editing at the moment um, is called Artorius, the Roman King Arthur. And the theory in that is that he was really based on a second century Roman legionary called Lucius Artorius Castus, Artorius being the Latin for Arthur, and that his, his deeds um, found, uh, caused the foundation of later Arthurian tales. Then you have to jump forward to the 6th century and you get another leader um, at a time after the Romans had left Britain um, the Saxons began to come in from across the sea and to try and take over. And at that time, one man came forward who assembled um, all the sort of usually quite fighting and feuding tribes in Britain into, into a hole and assembled an army and fought off the Saxons. And basically he kept the Saxons pinned down along the coast of Britain for long enough for them to stop being invaders and become settlers. So he's a very crucial figure um, in, in our history um, and he was never forgotten. Whether or not he comes from a collection of folklore or ancient tales or whether he is a real historical person is still very much open to debate. But what happened is whoever or whatever he was, he wasn't forgotten and people began to tell stories about him. And from probably I would say the 12th or 13th centuries onward, a whole series of books appeared. I mean, the, the golden period, if you like, in Arthurian literature begins with Geoffrey of Monmouth um, in the 11th century and ends with Mallory in the 15th. So in that 500 years, a huge amount of literature was produced hundreds and hundreds of stories, and it was completely international. There are stories from Spain, from Italy, from France, from Germany, um, even a Hebrew version. And people uh, loved the stories. They always, they seemed to want more all the time. They were always asking more stories about, um, about Arthur, please. And so from someone who may not have been a king, um, he, we, he emerged as such a, an important leader that suddenly he was King Arthur. And King Arthur had a court at Camelot, and he had the magic sword Excalibur, and uh, he had the Knights of the Round Table. All of these things were added, I think, to that much earlier story. Again, very difficult to prove one way or the other. And it just grew and grew and grew, and it really has never stopped. I mean, there was a, a break between the 15th and um, 18th centuries when it wasn't so popular. Uh, and then suddenly in the 19th century, in the Victorian era, uh, they did rediscovered it, and that was the beginning of what has become a total avalanche. You know, there are hundreds of new books on this subject published every year. That I find just fascinating. I, I didn't know of Arthur's uh, international appeal in antiquity, that he mm. is far away as the Middle East. Um, are, are, are those stories... Uh, is that just oral history? Are these being copied in manuscripts? So we have a, a, a document trail of this? Oh, documents, definitely. There is a trail. I mean, a lot of them were, you know, versions of the same story. So you'd get something like uh, you had a, a French poet called Chrétien de Troyes, who wrote the, one of the earliest Grail stories. And then you've got about five or six versions of that, one in Italian, one in Icelandic, uh, the King of Iceland at that time absolutely loved Arthurian stories and had lots of them copied and translated into Icelandic. Um, you have French. And then there came along um, from the right at the end of the 12th century until the middle of the next century, uh, a vast compilation known as the, uh, the Lancelot Grail Saga. This, is, this runs to seven volumes. And it's, it's a very, it was written down mostly by monks, so it's very religious. It's full of theology. And this is one of the books that Mallory got hold of. He got hold of, the, of what was then called the Vulgate Cycle. And he translated a lot of it. And he also 
took out all the theology and left us with the bare bones of the story. So he was already retelling much earlier stuff, just as I am in my book, but he was giving it his own stamp, as I have tried to do in mine. So let's talk about your book. You've um, kind of done, like you said, a, a similar thing that Thomas Mallory did, uh, but you've created a new uh, collection of, of the stories for the 21st century. Uh, can you walk us through the, the great book of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table? Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing I did, um, I mean, I, I've known many of these stories and I have, I've, I've told them in public. I've written versions of them at various times, worked with these things for years. And um, what I wanted, following on in Mallory's footsteps, was to create a presence because in the Mort Arthur, Mallory is very present. He's often pops up and will and say, please pray for me a, a knight prisoner or a poor man cast in prison or whatever. Um, and I thought, well, I won't do that, but what I will do is create a kind of alter ego for myself. Um, so I did that. I have a little nameless scribe um, who lives sometime after Mallory, worships the book and thinks, oh, but Sir Thomas left out all these great stories. Maybe I can collect them. So that's what he does in the form of the book that I've written. So it's got that kind of running narrative that connects the stories together a little bit. Um, and I looked all over the place. As I said, there are 38 of them. They're divided into books. The book one is the Book of Merlin, which tells the very early stories of the coming of Merlin. Um, and the story of the female knight of Venable. Um, then you move on to book two, the book of the round table, which is, if you like, the main stories of the knights. So it's got, you know, it's got the, the vows of King Arthur and his knights, which is actually a kind of medieval ghost story. Uh, the knight of the parrot, which is a comedy. Um, How Sir Lancelot found his name, which tells the origins of Lancelot, because in Mallory, he just shows up. He's suddenly there. Everybody realizes he's a great knight, a great fighter. No one can defeat him. Guinevere falls in love with him and all that. I wanted to know a bit more about his origins. So I looked back to an old French text and found that um, in that story, he is brought up by a fairy woman. Um, in fact, the Lady of the Lake, who later features in mm -hmm. all the stories as bringing him his weapons and so on. Mm -hmm. So... It moves on, uh, book three is the book of Gawain, which is, Gawain was originally the most famous of the knights before Lancelot. So I told some of his stories. Book four is the book of the Grail, in which I found some different versions of that story. Um, and the last one, book five, the ending of the round table. And with this one, I was very lucky because I discovered a story that had never been translated into English that no, almost no one knows about it. Um, and I retitled it The Voyage to Avalon. And basically, this is a story told in the first person, which is very rare in medieval manuscripts. Um, from about from Arthur's book. point of view? It's told from the point of view of Guillaume de Torel, hmm. who is an, uh, the writer of it. But he, he writes in the first person, mm -hmm. as though he's telling you a story that really happened to him. And what happens is, I won't spoil it, but he goes riding uh, along the shore one day and he sees a whale out in the water and the whale speaks to him and says, get on my back. I'm going to take you somewhere. So he gets on the whale's back and the whale swims off across the sea and they arrive at an island. And the island is in fact Avalon, which is the magical place to which um, Arthur is supposed to have been taken at the end of his life to recover from his wounds. And there on the island, Guillaume meets Arthur. That's all I'll say. But it's an amazing story. And it was the perfect end for the book. The year is 871. You are a 15-year-old girl. Danish Vikings sweep across England. Unaware, you run from the priory where you were raised, right into a conquered kingdom. The books of the Circle of Caradon Saga are set in late 9th century England and Scandinavia. The saga has been held by the Historical Novel Society as epic and immensely satisfying, 
and have over 6,000 Amazon five-star reviews. If you are a fan of the novels of Bernard Cornwell or Diana Gabaldon, you will feel right at home in the world of the saga. Available everywhere as ebooks, print, and award-nominated audiobooks. The Circle of Caradon Saga, 10 books and counting. And book one is free by signing up at Octavia.net. I am Octavia Randolph, and I welcome you to the adventure. Thank you to the sponsor for this week's episode, author Octavia Randolph. If you would like to download a free copy of the first book in her series, you can find a link to her website down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Now back to my conversation with John Matthews. Uh, I unfortunately haven't had the opportunity to read the, the whole book. I, I read the uh, the coming of Merlin um, a little bit uh, yesterday and the, and the day before, and I I love the structure of your book and your literary device of the of the storyteller. Um, yeah. it, it's a great way for that you use to offer commentary from a somewhat of an academic point of view, but without it seeming that way. Yes, that's what I was trying to do. I didn't want it to be something that people would look at and think, "Oh my God, that's really too much, too much for me." You know, um, I wanted them to see how powerful the stories were. And, you know, when you simplify the language, you reveal some of the complexity of the story, but also the simplicity of what underlies it. So I try to do that throughout and hopefully make language that was neither too medieval nor too modern. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think you strike a great, a perfect uh, balance there. Thank you. Um, so having... Um you know, work with this material for so long. Uh, do you have a favorite, a personal favorite Ar Arthurian tale? Um, I don't think I really have favorites. Uh, there's, there isn't one. I mean, Going in the Green Knight, which is not one of the stories I told in this book because there are so many versions of it already, um, is, is one of the greatest. Um, I mean, the one I mentioned to you, the one I, that, that I kind of discovered, that was, that's very special for me at the moment because it is so unique it's completely different and I love the Merlin stories and especially I love the Celtic stories that I put into this because they're always very wild you know they they have much more energy and wildness and magic than the more obviously medieval French German Italian kind of set of stuff and, and those stories predate the coming of Christianity, and so it, they la don't have the theological overtones. Well, in fact, they were they were written down after um, the most of the the more well known medieval ones, including Mallory. But they are based on much older stuff, and they read very much like uh, you know really primitive tales. I mean, I had to make some changes to some of them because they would have stood out so much from the rest of them, um, not, not large changes. I just had to moderate the language a little bit here and there and make it more, more sort of immediate, if you like, rather than mysterious. Um, but some of them are quite funny as well. Uh, and they have things in them that the visage, village of the gray hammed lady, for instance, this is a, a fairy woman who arrives at Arthur's court and, Everyone falls in love with her and she gets to stay for a while. But she has a secret that there is a tuft of grey hair growing behind one of her knees. And she tells this to somebody in confidence who then goes and spread the word round the court. Gossip away, gossip away. And only because she's a fairy lady, she says, well, I'm not allowing that. I'm sorry. And it was one of the women who told about her. So she said, well, I'm going to take all the men away. And she just casts a spell on them and she takes all these all the round table knights follow her and they all go off into the other world where she introduces them to some rather nice fairy ladies so everybody's having a good time i mean it's comic but it's also serious as well underneath um and eventually you know somebody comes along who's brave enough and clever enough to show that actually the men aren't that bad and the women actually weren't going to be as horrible as she thought they were and so everything goes back to normal again. 
But it's that kind of wild strangeness that I love about those stories. I like that. Very, very mystic. It is. It is. Uh, so one thing we haven't mentioned yet about about your volume is um, just how wonderfully illustrated it is. Um, oh, I, yes. I, I think I can confidently say that this is the most uh, beautiful book that I've uh, looked at for this podcast. Um, why do you think that that was important to have such wonderful illustrations for it? Well, I think it was, I think it's always good to have something that feeds your imagination. I mean, the words, words should be enough in some ways, but I sometimes think occasionally you need a little assistance to do this. And um, I was very fortunate that um, I've known the illustrator here, John Howe, who is best known for being one of the two artists who designed the Lord of the Rings movies. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've known him for some years, and we were we've often talked about collaborating on something. And when this came on, one came along, he was actually working on the new Netflix Lord of the Rings series that's about to begin. And I thought well, there's no way he'll have any time, but I I'll ask him anyway. And to my delight, he said, "Oh yes, I'll make time because this is this is going to be good." So, you know, over the next few months, I got these wonderful pictures through through the mail, and then he did some black and white ones, and most of them are in color. There are 15, I think, in color. And then he does lots of little black and white vignettes as well. And the whole thing just, it just took off, you know, it just lifted itself. And then I was fortunate enough to get Neil Gaiman, who's also a friend, and I'm a great admirer of his, uh, to write the forward. And so, you know, we got, we, we've got a pretty good lineup here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Neil Neil Gaiman, as 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 I'm sure many people are familiar with, a, you know, a lot of his work. Um, and then uh, probably a lot of listeners have a copy of the Lord of the Rings on their shelves uh, with the the same style of beautiful illustrations that that John Ho provides. Yeah, well, John John Howe and Alan Lee were the two great um, great illustrators of the Tolkien work, and still continue to do so. And I'm fortunate enough to be friends with both of them. So, um, you know, and Alan was too busy at this time, but John wasn't was was willing to, you know, come in and help me. So, fantastic! I, I feel very lucky and very fortunate to um, have had this wonderful contribution. Probably everybody does this. The first thing I did when I when I got a copy of your book in the mail is I just kind of thumbed through and looked at. Well, I think also the publisher did a great job with the layout. You know, I mean, you've, we've got these little introductory bits at each beginning of each story, which are printed in red, and mm -hmm. the title along the top of the page is in red, and the page numbers are in red, and it somehow it makes it feel more like an, a more ancient book, which which I love, of course. Yeah, and the the structure of it, um, it's not like a history book where you're going to have this entire volume, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read it from cover to cover. It's it's mm. something that you can have on your bookshelf, and if you're if you decide, I, you know what, I want to read, I have enough time, I have a half an hour, I'm going to sit, I'm going to read an Arthurian tale. Uh, you mm -hmm. can go through it in one sitting, uh, and it's a nice piece of literature to have on your on your bookshelf. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I think that's what I wanted to do. And um, although I didn't want it to be too serious or academic, just for those who do want to know more about the background, I put in some quite extensive notes at the end, um, which basically tell you which bits of the stories I left out and which bits I changed and why. And also there's a good list of the texts that are available in English, um, which are probably about half half or maybe a little more than half of the ones I've done um, in, in tran direct translations of medieval texts. So for those who are, you know, love this material and want to go deeper, that, that information is there as well. So uh, one of the last things here that, that I wanted to ask you, and, and there may not be an answer for this, I don't know. Uh, what is it about Arthurian legend that have, I mean, as soon as it started being produced, it became quite popular. It traveled throughout the European continent. Uh, here we are hundreds of years later, we are still sharing these stories. Uh, you personally, you've chosen to dedicate your life to these stories. Um, what 
has been the influence of Arthur and what is it about these stories that just make them so timeless and influential? Well, I wish I had, um, I wish I had some money for every time people have asked me that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here I thought I was being original. No, 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 sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, well, it isn't an easy question to answer. And I suspect that almost anybody you asked would give you a different one. But for me, I think they are timeless because they are about human experience. I mean, we've got, yes, there's a lot of magic. There's a lot of swords and, and, uh, and sorcery. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, racing about on horseback and fighting other knights and so forth. But there's also love, honor, respect, um, joy, um, religious ecstasy, uh, spirituality. I mean, there's so much. There's something of, for everybody, I would say. Um, and some of them, I was ama I'm still amazed now over 40 years of studying these things, I'm still amazed at how modern some of them were in some respects, you know. I mean, I've often had lots of people say to me, oh, it's very much a masculine thing, isn't it? It's all about these men waving swords. T.H. White, the guy who wrote The Ones of the Future King, said that Mallory's book was full of the knight's batting averages. <laughs> and it's true in some ways, because there is the, there's a lot of how many, how many spears you broke in, in the lists against this other knight and so forth. But ultimately, there, there's a huge amount of human experience and uh, wisdom in there. Um, I mean, I was surprised at the story about um, a Venable that I mentioned, who, be, who is a, a girl who becomes a knight, and no one knows she's a girl for a long time. And um, when I was near the end of the book, I came across another one, um, a story called Morian which was actually from the Netherlands. And this is a 13th century story about a, a man who is um, part Western and part Eastern. He's Moorish. Um, and uh, he sets off on a quest to discover his, uh, his father's identity. And he meets up with a lot of Arthur's knights and they have adventures together. And what struck me immediately about this is that this is a man of color and probably Muslim at a time when um, they were not popular. Um, and yet in the book, in the story, um, he's treated exactly as normal. There is no tra trace of, of, of racialism at all in there. And I thought that was extraordinary for that time. And so I was very pleased to include that story as well. That is very remarkable considering the proximity to the Crusades and Exactly. The crusades were happening, uh, beginning to happen anyway, while that story was being written, but there's no trace of that. Interesting. You know, it really is exciting to me to see that, um, you know, people were able to see past those, uh, you know, those that racial stereotyping, if you like, and the same with the, with the girl becoming the knight, you know, again, and people, I mean, a lot of people have said to me over the years that, that they are very masculine stories, but what people forget is that those who were the real movers and shakers behind the, uh, you know, behind the legends were almost all female. Admittedly, most of them are fairy women, otherworldly women. But then you think of Guinevere and Isolt and uh, Elaine of Carbonek, the, the, the daughter of the Grail King. These are all characters whose parts in the story are very, very important. They have real agency. They're not, they're not just damsels in distress. Absolutely, yeah. I like that, and that and that does resonate with with a modern audience. It does, it does, and I think it's important that people do see that as well. Um, it's not just all about adventures and you know whatever. It's it's there's a lot of love, there's a lot of tenderness, um, there's a lot of sensitivity in there. These were not just cutthroats, you know, running around, chopping people up, and you know, wearing fancy armor and carrying shields with paintings on them, you know, they were people who actually had feelings and experienced things. There's some very moving stories in, the, in, in my collection too, and in Mallory. All right, uh, well, John, uh, this, this was a lot of fun. Um, I, think, I think you have a, a lot of uh, hi history buffs, you, ha you have their dream job, I think. Um, <laughs> 
it's fun. I do. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I didn't train as an historian, but I, um, you know, I think of myself as a freelancer, really, which gives me a lot more scope. Mm. Um, I don't have to tie the, the toe the line um, yeah, academically. Uh, but I live in Oxford, so I'm surrounded by other people who are, you know, working in their own way at these things too. So, so we have some interesting conversations. All right. Well, if uh, someone would like to pick up a copy of uh, the great book of King Arthur, uh, where can they go to get a copy of your book or where can they go to learn more about you and your other work? Well, um, the book, as they say, is should be available in all good bookstores. I'm um, also from the usual suppliers like Amazon. Um, it's published by HarperCollins, so it's quite widely distributed everywhere. Um, it's out there in the shops right now. Um, if you really were desperate and wanted to have a signed copy, you could buy it directly from us. Um, though, of course, it will cost you a lot in postage because since... Um, Brexit here and also um, the, the pandemic postage has gone through the roof. So if you're in America, I suggest you buy one from a bookshop out there or from a supplier out there. If you really do want a signed one, I'd be very happy to do it, but be aware it's a heavy book. The postage will be astronomical. Um, it, it is a pretty good sized book, yeah. <laughs> it's a heavy book. It's a heavy book. And to find out more about our work, my work and, and that of my wife, Kathleen, um, you, we have a website, um, which is HalloQuest, it's one word, H-A-L-L-O-W-Q-U-E-S-T dot org, O-R-G dot U-K. So if you go there, you'll hear about our work. We do a lot of teaching, um, both here, I sometimes teach in the States, um, and, and a lot of books. Uh, I've personally written over 150, so there's quite a few to choose from that are not all in print, sadly. Um, so, yeah, that's the best way to find out more about what we do. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, John, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much to my guest, John Matthews, for joining me from all the way in the UK to talk about his new book, the Great Book of King Arthur. And thank you very much to you for taking the time out of your day to listen. Uh, if you would like to pick up a copy of The Great Book of King Arthur, you can find a link to it in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Uh, I've got a copy on it on my shelf. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. And then if you enjoyed my conversation with John Matthews, uh, expect him to come back. Uh, he told me a little bit about what he's working on off the air. And uh, you'll probably see him again uh, on this podcast in, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, well, I hope that uh, you will stick around as summer comes to a close. Uh, summer is definitely over. Kids are back in school. I'm starting uh, my classes that I teach. Um, so summer's definitely come to an end. But there is no end of episodes in sight. Uh, join me next week uh, as we look at... Uh, at the Sioux Nation, uh, Chief Sitting Bull, and Crazy Horse. Uh, and then after that, uh, we are going to be looking into a more contemporary issue, uh, one that affects American politics today. We are going to be looking at the uh, rise of religious nationalism in the United States. Uh, that is something that has kind of come to the forefront in American politics, uh, and it has a history that goes back about 150 years or so. Um, so definitely interesting. Uh, I have a guest, uh, Catherine Stewart, who's come on the podcast uh, to tell us a little bit about her research. So until next time, see you then.